registrant or an as as an attendee. <laughs> ah, praise the Lord. Okay, so type your questions into the chat box, and if we and if selected, we will ask um will ask the question on your behalf. So please remain muted for the whole event. Without further ado, um. I will ask um, Cleo Douglas to take um, take it from here. And I think some of you would have missed the first bit that I said, but it's fine. Um, what we're here to do is to hear Professor um, do what he does best. And Cleo, Hi, uh, it's yours. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Thanks very much. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome once again for attending SACO Presents. Uh, my name is Cleo Douglas. I am chair and also trustee of Sutton African Cultural Organization, aka SACO. Um, SACO is a small charity uh, working in the, the London boroughs of Sutton, Croydon and Merton. And we're primarily run by volunteers. Um, we are an intergenerational charity working within the community to enhance and provide leisure and enrichment activities from an African Caribbean perspective. We are delighted um, to have here tonight Professor Akeem Adi um, share his journey through the rich history of the Black African and Caribbean people within Britain, something I wish when I was growing up knew more about and also a topic I feel strongly um, should be taught in our schools as I feel many young people of today need a greater understanding of where African Caribbean came from um, and also where they've been. Without further ado, please may I welcome Professor Hakim Adi. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here and to uh, share with you some, uh, what can we say, some information, some knowledge maybe um, that we all have and we're here to, to share it uh, together. What I'm going to do is just um, say a little bit about my book, if I may. Um, I'm going to just share my screen. Let me just see if I can do that very quickly. Uh, there we go. I hope everybody can see that. Um, I'm going to just say a little bit about the book. The book is um, something I hope will be useful for everybody. I, it deals with about 10,000 years of history. Um, and so I can't possibly deal with all of it tonight or even some of it. It has about 50, yeah, something like that, about 50 pictures, images, but we don't really have time to deal with those either. I'm going to select just a few and say a little bit about them, just to give you an idea of what's in the book, what the book contains. Um, and then I understand there are going to be some uh, questions, uh, which I'm happy to, to answer. And then we can maybe come back to some of the, the history as it's the beginnings of what people call Black History Month, because for me, every month, every day, every hour, every minute is about the history of those of African and Caribbean heritage. Um, I have to say whether in Britain or, or elsewhere, because I'm really a, hist a historian of Africa and the African diaspora. So my interests are kind of global, but this particular book focuses on Britain. So the, the first slide I'm going to show you is this one. And one of the problems when we look at the history of, of Britain is that there's a lot of, what can I say, propaganda, really. A lot of effort to say that everything began in 1948 with the arrival of a certain ship, I won't mention. But this is a big falsification of history, a denial of history. Africans, people of African heritage, have been in this country for thousands of years. Um, some people would argue that even before the ancestors of the English were here, there were there were Africans here. And in the book, I go into some of these ideas, some of this history. But I'm going to start just a couple of thousand years ago uh, tonight. This is a reconstruction of a woman who lived in Britain in, in Roman times. 
That's about 1700 years ago. She lived in the city of York. And this is obviously a reconstruction of what she looked like from her skeleton. And you can see the skull on the left-hand side of this picture. Now, these days, science is actually quite good at reconstructing people from uh, DNA evidence. It can tell all kinds of things about skin color and hair and all sorts of things, where people came from. All of that can be done through scientific analysis. So the reconstruction of this woman, we think is pretty accurate. She was a young woman, a young African woman living in York. Uh, she's known to historians as Ivory Bangle Lady because we don't know her name, but she was buried with various jewelry, including ivory bangles. She came from Africa, uh, clearly, and she's just one of many Africans who were in Britain at that time, 1700 years ago. In fact, the Roman emperor of that time, a man called Septimius Severus, who also happened to live in York and died in York, was also from Africa. He came from Libya. But there were many others, men, women, and children. We don't know necessarily what they all did. This particular woman is interesting because she was quite wealthy. We know that from the kind of things she was buried with. So she's quite a wealthy young woman, probably came from Africa, like many others in this period. So these kinds of this kind of information gives us a totally different view of British history. Um, and we know that in the next few hundred years, there were also many Africans here. We don't necessarily know why they came or what they were doing here. Um, but we, from their remains, we can be very clear about where they came from. In fact, only recently, a few, literally a few months ago, a skeleton of a young child was found in, in Kent. When the DNA analysis was done, it showed that probably not, not her herself, but probably her father or her grandfather came from West Africa, from what is today Nigeria. This was in the, in about the seventh century, so about 1300 years ago, why this young girl was living in Kent, why her father or grandfather had come from what is today Nigeria to England, nobody knows yet. But this is just part of the history. And the more investigation people do, the more information they find. And of course, we don't necessarily have pictures of all of these people who lived 100 years ago. But this gentleman, I'm going moving forward uh, quite a few hundred years as to when we have actual images this gentleman in the middle, we know his name. He was called John Blank. He was a trumpeter in the court of the kings of the time, uh, Henry the Seventh, Henry the Eighth. This is dated from about fifteen eleven, something like that. And John Blank was a royal trumpeter. We know all kinds of things about him. He was married. He demanded a wage increase from the king. He got his wage increase and so on. But again, he's just an example of many Africans who were here in Elizabethan times, Tudor times, the times of Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, and so on and so forth. Uh, they were here. Many of them came from Europe although some came directly from the African continent. Again, they did a variety of jobs. There were men, there were women, there were children, there were musicians, there were divers, there were needle makers, there were owners of property. There were a whole range of different people who were here at that time. So this is all part of Britain's history. It's nothing particularly... Um, or shouldn't be surprising about it. Um, but for too long, it's been hidden or denied or um, obscured in some way. And it's very important that we just tell the story of Britain as it is, uh, or as it was. There's no need to hide anything um, 
or to push anything under the carpet or to deny anything. This is just the facts of history. Now, I've got so many images, so, I mean, where do we start? Uh, this is another trumpeter. This is in the 18th century. It was quite common at that time for Africans to be in the in the forces, in the army, in the navy. Um, this actually comes from the king's personal collection. Uh, I mentioned I was coming to talk to the Sacco people. And he said, well, Hakim, you must show them this uh, nice painting that I have. Typical of the 18th century, what we might find in that period. Again, I'm going to move on because of time and so on. This gentleman, Alado Equiano, very famous African of that late 18th century period, formerly an enslaved person who liberated himself and then wrote a very famous autobiography, which was a bestseller. And this is the picture from the inside of that autobiography. And he was also a, a political activist, a campaigner, a person who campaigned against human trafficking, the human trafficking of African men, women, and children in that period when that evil practice, that crime against humanity, was one of the main activities of the British government. Um, and those it represented. I could say much more about Equiano, but I'm going to move on. Uh, what else have we got here? Well, this is a woman from the 19th century. Uh, her name was Fanny Eaton. She was originally from Jamaica, but she moved to, to London. Um, she's very, very interesting in that she was a very poor person. She had, I think, about 10 children. She made her living by cleaning other people's homes. Usually in history, we don't find much information about poor black women or poor Jamaican women. But she was unusual in that she, to make a little bit more money, she posed as an artist's model. And... She became an artist model for some very important painters who are known as a group as the pre-Raphaelite painters. And so many of them included her face in their, in their paintings. And we also have these sketches of her. Um, so there we have Fanny Eaton. Okay, well, there's so many people here. This gentleman, Actually, is kind of local for you guys. Kind of local, is it? Croydon local, I guess so. Uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor was born in Croydon in 1875. Is best known as a classical composer. Um, he wrote all kinds of works for piano, violin. Uh, he was a, a teacher of music and uh, was known particularly for his work Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, which is like a choral, orchestral, choral and orchestral piece. Unfortunately, he died at a very early age in 1912. He was just 37 years old when he died. You can still find his music around if you've never heard of Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Uh, well, this gentleman was Walter Daniel Toll. He is best known as one of the early black footballers. You can see he played for probably the most important football team uh, in Britain, Tottenham. Um, he, was a, he was a striker, we could say today, a centre forward in old days for Tottenham. But he's known not just as an early footballer. He had a very interesting career because he served in the army during the first world war and he's the first person of color first black person born in britain to become an officer in the british army now why was that unusual well it's unusual because at that time 1914 1918 there was something called a color bar 
in the army. What that meant was if you were a person of color, you could not become an officer. And that color bar, which was the name given to racism in those days, existed in Britain right up until 1948. In many walks of life, in hotels, in the army, in different aspects of society, excuse me, until it was gradually broken down. I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop there. How are we doing for time? Maybe I'll just do one more. Uh, let's just see, which, where should we go? Uh, we'll do that one. Uh, let's do this one. This is a picture from the Second World War. And this woman's name is, uh, well, she's known as Nurse Ademola. She was from Nigeria. And she was just one of many African women who worked in the health service in this country, even before the NHS was founded, because this is in the early 1940s. There were women here from Africa, as well as from the Caribbean, who worked as nurses and also as doctors in the health service at that time. People often are more familiar with talking about nurses from the Caribbean, but there were also nurses from, from Africa uh, who were here. She was famous because during the war, a film was made about her um, to talk about her life. And she was the daughter of a very important person in Nigeria, King in Nigeria. And so this film was made about, unfortunately, the film has been lost, um, but we still have some of the stills from that film. So that's just, I mean, just to give you, I mean, a kind of a uh, little bit of, yeah, a little bit of some of the pictures and images in the book. Um, I'm going to stop there because I know that people might have questions. I know someone wants to ask me some questions. So I'll stop there. If we have more time, I'll come back and say more about the history which the book contains. But um, I think that we can do we can leave it there for the moment. There we go. So who's asking me questions? Good evening, Professor. It's Deborah here. Hi, Deborah here. How are you Hi. doing? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? I'm pretty good. Um, I just want to thank you for launching um, our Black History Month. We are very, very, nice. very pleased to see you. So thank you very much for your time. I'm very pleased to see you, only I can't see you. Oh, you? let me do this. Shut that far. There yes. you go. Okay. I might cut short some of my questions, actually, so that really? our, um, our viewers can um, get in on the act as well. But one of the things that I wanted to ask you, um, are you, I'm sure you're aware that there was a survey out a couple of days ago mm -hmm. about the majority of Black Britons not feeling proud to be British. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that um, the subtitle of your presentation was Black, African and Caribbean people in Britain, history to shape the future. I was wondering how you felt about that. I mean, it was no news to me. But there was a lot of um, umbrage about the fact that we might even dare to feel this way. And do you feel optimistic about the lives of Black Britons in the future? Um, well, I always feel optimistic because, um, you know, one thing that history teaches us is that our future lies in our own hands. So the future depends on us. It's not independent of us. If we, as well as others, uh, organize ourselves appropriately, then any situation can be changed. And I would imagine that many people feel alienated from this society because of the way that they are treated in this society or treated by... Um, yeah, I mean, how society treats them, that we still have, you know, massive problems of 
racism in its various forms, um, whether that's, you know, the violence of police or the so-called Windrush scan or the various laws which exist, which are openly racist, or the education system, which is often very Eurocentric and so on. So those things are bound to alienate you. If I just take my own subject of history, if you go to school in this country, as I did, and as other people have, and you never see uh, anything, you never learn about anything in history that relates to Africans or people of African heritage, or you never hear anything positive. In my own case, I didn't hear anything positive or negative. So you grow up in a society which ignores you, which hides you, where you don't exist, where you never see anything positive about Africa or people of African heritage. That has a big impact on young people growing up. It had a big impact on me growing up. And so you don't, how could you feel part of that society if that society rejects you and so on? And then when you're, you know, you're walking along the street, you know, the, the police do this or the police do that and so on. So you live in an environment which is going to alienate you. And so for, for many people today, um still feel that alienation and so it's not surprising that people um say they don't identify as british or whatever the the survey said and when i was young almost nobody identified as british so you could say if 50 percent of people now identify that's maybe that's uh, a step forward um but yes there are still massive problems but um we have a responsibility to do something about them you know i talked about in my presentation i talked about equiano very very briefly so equiano was as i said an activist in britain at a time when millions of people in britain were taking action against human trafficking the human trafficking of africans now most people don't know that in the 17 80s 1790s that movement of people in britain against what people call the slave trade human trafficking that movement was one of the biggest political movements ever in britain's history ever it included working people women africans all united and so on and it played a big role in changing things in this country it wasn't the only thing which changed things but it played a big role but in history lessons or in the media or in, we don't hear anything about that so if the country doesn't give you anything if you're not taught anything to be proud of what why why would you be what why would you feel proud so history has an important role to play in helping people understand the country that they're in its history why things are the way they are what people have tried to do to change them and it also gives us the confidence that yes we can change things things are not the same as they were 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 500 years ago everything changes and we are the agents of that change we are the his makers of history and so I'm optimistic. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad there's optimism, optimism out there. That's great. So talking about history, um, let's get back to the current um, status of your university course, which has now been abandoned. You've been made redundant. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So what's the state of play now regarding the campaign? How far are we in helping you and your students? Well, um, I should explain because some people may not know exactly what we're talking about. So maybe just to explain very, very briefly. Sure. At the University of Chichester, we used to have a course which was called an MRes, meaning a master's degree by research in the history of Africa and the African diaspora. Now that course was set up, established in 2018. It's been running for about five years. 
And it was established especially to encourage people of African and Caribbean heritage to engage with history, to become historians. And the reason for that is that there's, again, this problem of alienation, that young people in particular, young black people, young people of African and Caribbean heritage, do not like studying history in this country. Why is that? Because the kind of history they're taught largely excludes them or and their ancestors or is negative about them and so we were trying to redress that address that problem redress that imbalance by establishing the course we ran it for five years very successfully and so on however this year the university decided to claim that it didn't attract enough students and they closed it down that yeah effectively it's closed effectively um and then they used that as an excuse to also uh, dismiss me, to basically to sack me. So the my students, because I not only teach on that course, I have PhD students. In fact, altogether about 16 students, all of African and Caribbean heritage. The students got together, they launched a campaign, they brought out a petition, 12,000 people in a few weeks, three weeks, I think 12,000 people had signed that petition from all over the world. All kinds of things were done to try and persuade the university to see sense. So far, they have not done so. And so we are still campaigning. There will be a legal challenge to what the university have done, both my redundancy, the closure of the course, of course, the situation the students are in at the moment is a kind of state of limbo. Nobody's teaching them or supervising them and so on. So the main thing that people can do to help is really, uh, at the moment, is fundraising. We're raising funds throughout October. There is a series of talks on Zoom that people can find the details on social media. I think actually the organizers have those details. I don't know whether you can put them in the chat, um, but those details, those details can be circulated to everybody. Um, a series of talks by my students starting on the 4th of October. Uh, tickets are available on Eventbrite. Just look for save the M res and you'll find. But we can send, we can I'm sure we can send the link. Um, and then on the 19th of October in East London in Hackney at B6 College. Uh, thank you, Sally. Um, I will be launching the paperback edition of the book you can see behind me. Um, so, yeah, if people want to come along on the evening of the 19th of October books will be available i'll say a bit more about it and that is also a fundraising event tickets also available on eventbrite and everyone's very welcome to come along so that's the main thing we're doing at the moment is fundraising for the legal campaign which will be uh, well launched very very soon that's good to know that's good to hear and behind you i can hear that you're sorry i can see that your book is up for a history prize the wolfson history prize it is funny you should see that yeah <laughs> yeah the wolfson history prize is so they tell me the most prestigious history prize in britain it's given every year to a book which the judges declare is the winner it's it's given for making history accessible really to for, for putting history in simple language that people can understand and every year six people are shortlisted or six books are shortlisted for that prize as a prize of uh, 50,000 pounds so my book is one of those that's been shortlisted which I'm very happy to say and those who are shortlisted also get a prize so everybody's a, a winner in that sense so yeah that's what the Wilson prize is I wish you well with that Thank you so much. When the decision, when do you know where you where you stand with that? Sorry, with the Wolfson? Yeah, when is the decision made? As to uh, November. Happened? November the, I think it's November the 13th. It's a Monday. 
Not too long to wait now, then. About six weeks, maybe, something like that. And continuing on the theme of um, the future and being optimistic, mm -hmm. um, do you think that financial reparations for the Caribbean is achievable by 2031? Do you think it's inevitable or is it just a pipe dream of ours? 2031, that's eight years' time. Mm. I've forgotten why I picked 2031, but there was a reason, and I okay. can't remember the reason, but there was a reason behind that, that year. But just generally so, speaking, do you think within the next 10 years, reparations are a done deal? Well, it's um, increasingly, obviously, the Caribbean, or certainly the Anglophone Caribbean, are very much united. CARICOM is, seems to be pretty much united on the demand. Um, of course, it's not only Caribbean countries that are calling for reparations because uh, African countries are also calling for reparations. I think the um, president of Ghana made a, a statement just a few days ago. So there's a, a kind of concerted effort, but CARICOM is in the forefront of those demands. I think it depends not just on what is being demanded or the fact that CARICOM or Caribbean countries are demanding it, but it also requires um, action in this country as well. It, it needs, for example, um, efforts to change the attitude of British governments to the question of reparations. And so we also have a responsibility to uh, play our part in that as do other, other people in Britain. Um, to hold really to hold governments to account obviously um, reparations is one of those words that also needs defining it doesn't just mean giving money it really refers to kind of repairing the damage which crimes in the past have caused and of course those crimes or the, the damage caused by those crimes is still continuing and in some way the crimes are still continuing because the uh, inequality that exists between Britain and other powerful countries which benefited from human trafficking, enslavement, colonial rule, European countries, the US, others that benefited from that, uh, those crimes um, and their relationship with those countries that were the, the victims, we can say. So whether that's African countries, Caribbean countries, South American countries, there's still an imbalance which exists. So any repair has to deal with those issues as well. It's not just a question of handing over so many trillion or whatever it is. It's also dealing with those imbalances, those inequalities. And that really needs a kind of massive change in the whole, what we could call the imperialist system of states, the whole international machinery, the way countries are run, the way countries are governed and so on. So will that happen within eight years? Well, who knows? It could, but I think it would need a concerted effort of everybody involved uh, to play their part in basically bringing in a, making sure there's a government in this country which is actually going to do the things that we want to be done, that we think need to be done, um, and bringing enough changing the situation in this country so that such a government exists. I think that will take a lot of struggle, but it's definitely possible. Thank you. And um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll go over to some of the questions that are coming in from the public. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you were born, your journey over here? My journey over here? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Okay. Well, I was born in uh, Paddington, mm -hmm. in uh, West London. So my journey, to, my journey to Sutton uh, didn't take very long. I just got on the tube. I didn't get on the tube actually as a baby. I don't think. Um, I don't know why, but I I thought you were born. I thought you were born in East Africa. Well, that's fine. Yeah, but you you can believe what you want to believe. Um, <laughs> I'm not aware that I was born. I might have been born. Maybe I didn't. Maybe you know something that I don't know. I might have been born in East Africa. <laughs> uh, I don't know where you got that information from, but 
it's possible your information is more reliable than what was given to me. I don't know. So, okay. Well, <laughs> and I don't know the answer to how I got here. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, well, I, was, I was always told that I was born in Paddington, but. Where's your family from, if you don't mind us asking? My family are from Nigeria, which is actually in West Africa, uh, and Britain, which is in Britain. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Right, let's see if there are, I'm sure there are some questions that we can throw open to you. Um, I'm just having a look. Um, I don't know if someone from SACO can help. Do you want me to read them? Yeah. <laughs> I can't actually see them. You can't see them? Okay, I'll see if there are any. I'll have to put my glasses on. Do you want me to? Yes, Hi. Could you choose one, Cleo? And yeah, sure. So it's actually one that I mentioned earlier. Um, in my in my um forwards so um question here do you think if there are steps being taken in schools to ensure that our true narrative in terms of history will be added in history lessons and i think the same person went on to follow that question through and the question is directed um to primary and high school curriculum it's a very complicated question um there are efforts to do that in schools um mainly those efforts are there are efforts by teachers this is a struggle that's been going on for many many years i mean i know i've been connected with it for at least 30 years and it it, it definitely dates back even longer than that certainly to the 1970s um people have been agitating demanding for changes to the curriculum in schools and those demands still continue in different forms and so on um in the old days they we used to put a lot of emphasis on the national curriculum on national curriculum history key stage one two and three and all that kind of thing um, so dealing with with primary and secondary school these days many schools are academies so they don't have to follow the national curriculum and so whatever is in the national curriculum has no impact on um, what is necessarily taught in schools they decide for themselves there, there's actually at secondary level or high school level there's actually a problem of young people studying history because there's some evidence you could say that um i'm hearing all kinds of strange noises don't know what they are but anyway the history curriculum in some ways has been made more difficult more academic and so some schools are reluctant to teach it or to teach it to gcse level um, because they are concerned that students will not get high grades at it and so then it's often substituted for things like media and so on so there are lots of difficulties and problems on the one hand there are those who are campaigning their teachers and others but there, there are also these very difficult problems and as you probably know the government is putting a lot of pressure on schools to teach subjects which are uh, in their words, employable, which students can then go on to, to do degrees or to do whatever other types of study, which are related, related to kind of vocational work, particular kinds of jobs and so on. So there's a lot of pressure on the teaching of history, the teaching of art subjects, the teaching of humanities generally in schools. And so it's an ongoing struggle because history is a, is a very, very important subject. Thank you, Professor Addy. Um, there's an, another one in the chat. Uh, it says, congratulations on being shortlisted for, for the Wolfen History Prize and great work, Professor. I'm rooting for you to win. What was... <laughs> we all are, we all are. Thank you what so was, much. Um, so you kind of like touched on this already. 
What would Black History 365 look like in schools and universities if it was adopted? Black History is part of the national curriculum in Wales, but not England. Why do you think that is? Well, I think, uh, you know, because people have got themselves more organised in Wales than they have in England is the, the short answer um, in terms of curriculum. I think that I mean, there's probably a little bit more to it than just having it as part of the curriculum. But anyway, I mean, that's in terms of the difference between Wales and England, that's a good step. I think the question of what would it look like 365 it would just be um, telling things as they are. You know, I explained earlier that Africans, people of African heritage have been part of Britain, British history for thousands of years. And so it's just a question of presenting that, not hiding that. Whatever subject you do, it's, it, it's you should include that information. But of course, we don't just study in schools and universities we don't just study british history we study european history we study world history in its various forms and it's including information which helps young people understand the world in which they live um let me let me just let me give you an example um because it's not simply a question of of um let me actually maybe i can demonstrate what i mean with i'm not going to go back to my uh see if i can do that can i do that let's have a go i just wasn't prepared so we'll just see let's go back 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 way back now you see for example some people would say what we need to have in school we need people to learn about you know uh, Walter Daniel Tull you know there were black people during the first world war they fought in the war this is very important that we know about them and so on. yes it is very important that we know that many people from the Caribbean from Africa from India from all over the world fought and died during the war but what is more important for young people you could say is to understand what the war was about and so if we look at this slide, this is from a gentleman called Isaac Hall. I think you can just about see it. Uh, I might need to uh, can I get this out of the way. Oops, no, I can't. Um, let me just remove this. It's more difficult to move than I thought. Um, but anyway, you can see most of what is said there. And this gentleman, Isaac Hall, was a Jamaican a carpenter who was opposed to the war, who refused to fight in the war at the time when there was conscription in this country. He was arrested, uh, imprisoned, tortured, but he refused to give up his views and in this uh, statement you can see why he refused to fight because he said the countries of Britain Portugal Belgium France and so on are those who have been the oppressors of his country and other countries in Africa and so on and so forth um, and of course, if we actually understand the nature of the war, we can say it was a war fought to redivide the world between these big European powers. Um, and in fact, the war began in Africa. In many ways, it ended in Africa. After the conclusion of the war in, in 1918, Africa was redivided between the major European powers. So when we look at history we're not just looking at were the representations of, of black people if you like or the representations of africa people we actually have to understand what was going on as well and so this kind of information about somebody who was a conscientious objector is just as important probably even more important in order to understand what this war um was about so 
we need a history which explains to young people helps them understand the world in which we live why it is the way it is why it was the way it was why certain things happen in the way that they do and so it's much more than as i say just having more black people in it it needs to be less eurocentric it needs to explain things in a way in which which helps young people and all people as i say understand the world in which they live and also change the world in which they live understand that history is about the study of change it helps us understand how we can actually change things for the better which is why the powers that be often get very concerned about history and history teaching thank you uh, professor addy um there's another question um given the stalemate with chichester are there any immediate plans to relocate the MRES to a different university? That's a very good question. We're open to offers. If you know somewhere that will take us, myself and my students, then um, we're very, very pleased to go. At the moment, there are various people in universities in this country and in other countries who say that they're interested. We haven't seen any thing concrete yet but of course we hope that um we hope that there will be an offer an offer will come from somewhere but as i say if you know anywhere if you're friends with a vice chancellor somewhere <laughs> i wish i was <laughs> then you know get in touch and we'll be happy to talk to them so yeah we're, we're waiting to see we're, we're doing everything we can but there's nothing i can't announce anything but maybe in the future that would be great and in fact very important, more important for the students in a way because they are in the middle of their studies they want to finish their, their PhDs their master's degrees it's everything has been disrupted by what's happened um you know they don't feel confident about being in Chichester it's everything's very very difficult so yeah we need to solve that problem that is actually the main problem that needs to be solved sure and the same person has asked, have you reached out to Burbeck? Um, have they reached out to me? No. Okay. <laughs> do you have some particular tie with Burbeck? If you do, then, um, you know, ask them to get in touch. Okay. Um, it's, it's not something that I can easily do. You know, I don't know, what do I do? Ring somebody up and say, I'm here. I don't know how I would do that. But if you, okay. you know somebody, then facilitate, okay. please. If there's anyone listening who, um, and, or the person who's just put the, mess, the question up with regards to Burbeck, um, you can reach out to SACO and we can pass the details on, or you can obviously um, look at Professor Ad Addy's um, website address, which we will put up in the chat and contact him direct. Thank you. Deborah? Oh, Deborah, you're... Apologies. Um, time is going, so I'm just going to sneak in this one for you, Professor. Do you think there will be a British Prime Minister of African descent within our lifetime? Uh, who cares? You don't think it would make... A difference i mean no. we have an asian prime minister and i'm sure has it, has it made it has it made a difference well it might do to the asian communities i don't think so you don't think so I think so you see um if you go to africa we have a lot of african prime ministers african presidents if you go to the caribbean similarly does it make a difference? But we're not minorities in those countries, are we? And in those islands? Well, um, you see, the, the point is, it's not really... Uh, um, it's not really what people look like. It's like saying, you know, did having Margaret Thatcher as a prime minister, did it make the world better for women? Well, no, it didn't. So it's not really about that. Um, I remember, you know, being in the US before Obama was 
elected, everybody was, you know, saying, oh, what do you ask me the same question? You think it'll make a difference? I said, no. And, uh, you know, what was Obama most famous for? Invading Africa. <laughs> So I don't know whether you ever read Obama's autobiography. His last one is about a thousand pages. And it's the oh. biggest excuse. It's the biggest excuse that's ever been written. If you read it, I've read it. It's just, I couldn't do this because. I couldn't do this because. I couldn't do this because. So the, the point is, we have a certain political system in this country. It's a very ancient political system. It's not really geared to solving our problems. It doesn't really matter who gets in office. And in fact, if somebody who might even get close to solving our problems is likely to get elected, um, you know, you saw this with uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Everybody comes out, the press, this, that, the other, they attack, they just get rid of them. So it's a, it's a bit more complicated than just having somebody who is of African heritage or Caribbean heritage or Asian heritage. You know, I think half the cabinet now are uh, the Conservative Party of Asian origin or African origin or whatever. It, it It's not as simple as that. And it's actually quite dangerous thinking in that way. Oh, let's have a Black Prime Minister, that'll make a difference. It creates illusions about things. and It doesn't work like that. What we need is um, a government which is concerned, is our government. When I say our government, I don't just mean people of African heritage or Caribbean heritage, but a government which actually con is concerned about solving the problems of the majority of people in this country, which means a government and a system where we are the decision makers, because this political system doesn't give us any decision-making power. You can put a cross on a piece of paper every five years, but you don't make any decisions about anything, about the health service, about the education system, about whether this country invades another country. You make no decisions. So we need a political system where we are the decision-makers. The majority of people decide and decide we want this and this is how we're going to get it and so on. And when people are elected, they're answerable to us. If they don't do what they say they're going to do, we can get rid of them and elect somebody else. So we don't have that system yet. And everybody who comes through the present system is likely to be very much like those who are in office today. So we need a bit more, I think, than just uh, a black prime minister or a black home secretary or a black foreign secretary or whatever it might be. In my opinion. Your opinion. Tailing on from that question, uh, Professor Addy, can I just ask a question? So, do you think that children, from a child's who's perspective, who's asking me? Who's asking me a question? It's myself. Who's myself? That's Cleo. Cleo. Oh, I can't see you, so I don't know. Who I'm sorry. Can you see me now? Go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So. From a child's perspective, so from a, um, a child who may be in primary school, for instance, if they saw someone like themselves who is in a position of power, so whether it be someone within politics, it could be a CEO, it could be someone like a TV presenter, do you not feel that that child will think, okay, anything's possible, there's a person like me doing like that role? Well, I mean, there are those people they may not be prime minister but we've had people who were you know chancellor of the exchequer or were in the cabinet mm. uh, or africans or our government ministers um there are people who read the news and so on and yes i mean it is good for um young people to see that yes they could they don't they don't they don't need to just aspire to be footballers or singers exactly yeah yeah exactly of course, that's true to show that there's a, a range of things that you can become a, a doctor or a pilot mm -hmm. yes and i mean that's much more likely now than it was when i was a child definitely yeah mm -hmm. and that's of course, that's a good thing yeah I, but i think on the question of politics it's a it's the 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 
previous question was much more, or anyway, the way I un understood it was much more about the kind of policies that are carried out rather than just seeing somebody there. And I think mm. in, in that sense, you know, that's why I answered it in the way that I did. But yeah, it's good for kids to see that they can do all kinds of things. And, um, but they should also understand that they need to do them a lot better <laughs> than those yeah. who are doing them at the moment. <laughs> because those who are doing them at the moment are not doing them in our favor, whatever mm. their color, their background, whatever. And we have a political system which is not in our favor. So a young person growing up needs to have a sense of, uh, you know, fairness, equality, of wanting to, you know, have a society where, um, you know, which doesn't have all the problems that we have today. I mean, just to give you an, an example from my childhood, you know, one of my heroes when I was a child uh, was was a person called Robin Hood. So I don't know whether people have heard of Robin Hood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I was a very young child, there was a television series about Robin Hood. Um, and the key thing about Robin Hood was he, he, helped, he helped poor people. Uh, that was his main characteristic. They were being oppressed. He helped them um you know the story about robin hood is he took from the rich to give to the poor so that he was my role model and the more i think about that the more i think what a effect that had on me throughout my life um so you know the kind of role models we have as, as kids yes it's good to you know think about all these things that we can become but we really want young people to be thinking about how they can help others, how they can change things for the better, how they can be, you know, useful to other people, how they can serve other people, these kinds of things. And if you, if your role model was a politician, you, you, you it's very unlikely that you'd be thinking of serving anybody else other than yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one has to, you know, if he, a child came and said, well, my role model is Rishi Sunak, I'd be very alarmed. <laughs> I think we all would be. <laughs> what kind of parents has this child got? Um, or who are any of these characters, you know? Um, you know, Kemi Badenoch or whatever her name is. I mean, is that your role model? I mean, come on, that's that would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, you take the child to a you know a psychologist or something and try and find out what was wrong with them so yes I, I don't think it's just about that it's about the kind of values that young people are are given and encouraged to have which you know are equally important brilliant we have another question do you think the new met for london at and the charters they are considering will make a difference to the way black people are perceived in the future? No. No. <laughs> no. I mean, again, it's a bit like the political system. The whole thing is rotten. You know, it's like people are saying, well, we're going to, the political system, we're going to do this, we're going to bring in this new law. We're gonna, it's not, that's not going to change it. Um, and, you know, the, the the police now, particularly in London, are just completely discredited. They have no, no, they have no credibility at all. Not just with black people, with women, with working people, with anybody. They have no credibility at all. So, um, you know, what do people want? People want, uh, you know... Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question, but people mm -hmm. want um, a, a police service which looks after the interests of people, you know, which, you know, and that doesn't mm -hmm. exist. Yeah. Exist. So, um, I mean, again, I could show you another slide, but I don't know whether we've got time for, for that now. Um, um, you, you could do. I've got one other question for you as well. Well, uh, I always, always like to, let's just see where we are here. Uh, oops, sorry, let me just go here. Actually, let me go back. Can I go that way? Yeah, that way, even. 
So this is my friend Aji on the, the right here. I went to university with a very, very long time ago. And this is her son, uh, Sheni, Ola Sheni, uh, who, what, over about 12 years ago now, um, was admitted to hospital in South London with some, I don't know, mental well-being, mental health problems. He was admitted to hospital as a, an, an outpatient. And in the course of the treatment in the hospital, he became agitated in some way. The hospital staff uh, felt that they couldn't control the situation or anyway calm him they called the police i think 11 police officers turned up and they they killed shenny so this case is quite a well-known case um but it's one of many numerous cases mainly involving young black men but not entirely um of and people will know this from their own experience of police being called to a situation you see on social media and acting in a very violent way um and never no, not only are the the uh is that their, their violence because the violence is one thing but the other thing is that the system doesn't hold them to account, is incapable of holding them into to account. I think of all these deaths, I think it's only Dalian Atkinson's death, if I'm not mistaken, where anyone has been ever been prosecuted, any police officer has been prosecuted and actually con convicted of, uh, of the death of any black person in this country. So, I mean, that is a terrible um state of affairs to have and one of the things that i try and document in the book are some of these cases over the years and it's one of the most difficult things about you know writing the book i mean for for example just to go on to another case there is you know stephen lawrence case for example now Stephen Lawrence case is what 30 years old something like that now and you imagine your son is murdered by these racists and then those who are supposed to be investigating it are what, what do you say about them equally racist incompetent of no interest and the inquiries that have gone, the inquiries that have been made into inquiries is still going on 30 years later. Wasn't it only a few months ago the BBC revealed that there were, instead of there being five murders, there were six? And this only came to light through a BBC investigation. So this has gone on for 30 years, government after government. Nothing has been done. Nobody's been brought to book. Nobody takes responsibility. One can go on and on and on. So it's not even a question of the Met because they're responsible to the Home Office, to the Home Secretary and so on. No one's been brought to book. No Home Secretary has been arrested or charged of any... Nobody is accountable. You know, one can go on. The so-called Windrush scandal. You know, Theresa May is even writing an autobiography or whatever, talking nonsense about it. Nobody is held responsible, either for the crimes or for the investigation or for the uh, lack of compensation in this case. And so it just goes on and on and on. And so it's that something wrong with the system is not people centered. Again, we don't have decision making powers, we can't hold people to account and so on so these are the things that have to be changed and dealt with otherwise it will just go on and on and on and on so um 
you know, changing the head or bringing in, you know, a new having a new report or this or that is not going to make any difference in my experience, not in my view, in my my experience tells me. Everybody's disappeared. Maybe I'll ask myself a question. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, let me see. Uh, okay, oh, hang on. Congratulations, stalemate. Do you think of new Mets? Started the young historian. Grace asked me a question. You started the young historians project. How are they influencing social projects and identity identity crisis for young people? Very, very good question. So the young historians project was started in <clears throat> 2015. Um, it came out of something called the History Matters Conference, which we held in that year. And the History Matters Conference was called to investigate why so few young black people studied history. You know, at that time, history was the third least popular subject amongst black undergraduates. Only veterinary science and agriculture were more unpopular than history. How, how can that be possible? Everybody's interested in history. So, and certainly at community level, as this meeting shows, uh, there's a lot of interest in history. So we, we set out to find out what is going on. We kind of knew what was going on, but we said, okay, let's have a conference. The conference was mainly addressed by young people, school students, university students, a few teachers, one or two people who are researching the problem. And in that day's conference, we people came to the conclusion, well, it's, you know, again, it's a systemic problem, it's a Eurocentric way history is taught, people, young people are alienated, the young people themselves said they were alienated. So one of the recommendations of the conference was to set up the MRES, which you heard me talk about earlier. And another proposal was to set up a project for young people to encourage them to engage with history. So we set up the Young Historians Project, the young people, young people of African and Caribbean heritage between the ages of 16 and 25. The young people choose their own, what they would like to focus on. Uh, they investigate it. And then they present the findings of their investigation to other young people. Um, that could be in a documentary film, it could be in a podcast, it could be an exhibition, it could be in a mural, it could be in a, a, what a, a physical exhibition, whatever way they choose. And the aim is to encourage other young people to engage. So that project has been going for eight years. Uh, we're now in our third project, mini project. Um, we first looked at an organization called the Black Liberation Front, because young people wanted to do that. Then they looked at African women in the health service uh, throughout the 20th century. And then they're now looking at this whole thing called what people call Black British history. How did it develop? How did it emerge? Who are the key figures? All these kinds of things. So, um, and they're doing one or two other things as well. There are some other small little things. So um, we train the young people to do research, to make films, to speak in public, to make podcasts, to do whatever they want them to do. Um, so if there are any young people around between the ages of 16 and 25 who are interested in being involved, we have people from all over the country from Birmingham, from Bristol, from all over the place. Um, they're very, very welcome. And I think a lot of our young people have gone on to do, some of them have gone on to do PhDs, some have gone on to do other things. Um, yeah. It's, Brilliant. That's good, yeah. I, I think if there are any other organisations here, they, they may show some interest in that. That's uh, definitely something that would... Um, benefit any community if I'm being honest and our young people also 
go out and give talks uh if people are interested in the work that they're doing um yeah so anything to do with history yhp is interested in it you can go to the website just search Young historians project it's all online and you can see for yourselves what they the kind of things that they do thank you over to you cleo thank you um the screen just gone off i do apologize so um Hopefully you can still see the screen, um, the shared screen. Just want to go through a couple of um, activities that we've got going on um, for the rest of the month, um, for Black History Month. So you can see the 6th and 20th of October, we've got Friendship Fridays, uh, which are our um, how can I, silver surfers, I like to call them, <laughs> who come together every other week um, and they do a, a range of activities. Um, we have talks there, um, people come in like Professor Akin come in and and do talks, so various things go on there. We have a film being shown at the um, Carshall to Methodist Church, Hidden Figures. 23rd of October at Morden Hall, uh, we've got a children's arts and nature session, which is a morning session during October half term. A self-empowerment um, workshop for women at um, the eco-local eco in Carshallton on the 24th of October. And then we have a finale event um, on the 27th of October at Sutton Cricket Club. So all of these events, there will be further information on our website, um, which is www.saco.org.uk. Um, and if there's anything that you, there will be a poll at the end of this, um, basically just asking you a few questions um, with regards to tonight's webinar etc um but yeah if you wish to support SACO become a member volunteer um help us on social media attend an event then just go to those um those web, web addresses and I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to um thank Professor Addy for this evening it's been very insightful um learned a lot I have your book Right, so, that's a very um, good investment, very sound investment. Very, very, very good. And I, I think it should be in all schools, like especially secondary schools. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying. So thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for attending. I know we've run over a bit, but I'm sure um, you'll, you'll be, um, just like me, think it's um, definitely valuable to hear uh, Professor Addy speak. So thank you for attending. Professor Addy, thank you. You're very welcome anytime. I've actually put a link in the chat before people disappear. They can see uh, they can see Linktree there, uh, all the things that we're doing in terms of fundraising events this month, uh, students' events, the book launch and so on. So maybe you can circulate that to people as well so people know exactly what's going on. Lovely, thank you. Yes. You can see it. Yeah, Brilliant. Recording. Okay. So just wanted to say goodbye. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Thanks, Prof. See you. Bye. See you next Thank time. You. All the best. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for attending.